All right. It's 9 o'clock. I'd like to welcome everyone here uh, to the Cotton Commission's annual meeting, and you are in the entomology section. I hope that's where you want to be. Uh, I'm Philip Roberts, extension entomologist located here in Tifton, and uh, we're going to be tag teaming this presentation today. I'm real excited. We have Dr. Bill Snyder. Uh, he's actually located on the Athens campus, and uh, his group has been looking at whiteflies the last couple years, so I I'm looking forward uh, to learning some things and uh, learning about whiteflies, so uh, hopefully we'll have some good discussion uh, as we move forward. But I want to take a few minutes and just touch on a few other things. I think someone took our uh, advancer, but first and foremost, as we're going into 24, it's going to be tight, right? Everybody agrees that. And in my mind, in a year like we're going into, it's all about making good decisions. When we talk about insects, the only way you can make a good decision is to know what's in the field. You know, it gets pretty easy with insects. You go out, you scout a field, have someone scout your field. If you exceed threshold, it's a good economic decision to protect the cotton, all right? So I do want to put in a little plug. We do two scout schools each year. Uh, we do one here in Tifton. It's always the first Monday in June. We also do one on the east side of the state in Midville. It's the second Tuesday in June. But myself and Dr. Mark Abney will spend half a day with you talking about scouting insects and cotton, peanuts, as well as soybeans. But uh, your county agents will be getting you additional information. Uh, just as a reminder for those upcoming uh, dates. Now, one of the things we do each year, and I, I, I kind of update you here at this meeting, is we uh, look at the two gene and three gene BT cottons, right? And we just monitor their performance. And we've done this now for, I don't know, what is that, six or seven years. And the way we do this and we do it at Midville Plains and Tipton, so we kind of spread out across the state. But we go in at the end of the year, and we actually look at damaged bowls, bowls that were damaged by corn earworms, okay? And we very simply can calculate percent control of a two-gene cotton or a three-gene cotton versus a non-BT cotton. And what you would notice in 2022 and 2023 we did see a reduction in percent control with our two gene BT cottons. We're somewhere between that 75 and 85 percent control the last two years, and that's still pretty good unless you have really high insect pressure. Now, most of the industry, we've moved to three gene, Bolgard 3, Twin Link Plus, Wide Strike 3, but there still was some two gene cottons out there. And all I want to do with this is just remind you, if you have a two-gene cotton, you know, if we have heavy pressure, we may need to supplement that, uh, supplement with an insecticide to make sure we achieve good control. <coughs> Another reminder, even if it is a Bolgard 3 or Twin Link Plus or Wide Strike 3, Three-gene cottons are not immune to corn earworms. I see Seth McAllister back there. He took some of these pictures. But just because you plant a Bolgard 3 or a three-gene cotton, it's not immune. So we still need to make good decisions. All right, a little more information. And, uh, again, this is just an update on some of the things we've done for several years now. And we've talked about pyrethroid susceptibility in corn earworms. Um, one of the things we do every year is we monitor susceptibility of corn earworms to pyrethroids simply by capturing moths in a pheromone trap and we place those in vials which have been treated with a pyrethroid insecticide. Um, what I'm showing here is a historical perspective, uh, and you can see, you know, back in the mid-2000s, you know, 
survival in these vials was low and it steadily increased. Now, in theory, the greater the survival, the less susceptibility. Now, going back to 2017, after we saw just really high survival at what we'll call the low rate, we started looking at a higher rate. And again, you see this incremental increase in survival, which suggests to us that pyrethroids are becoming less effective on that, that species. Y'all follow me? You got any questions? Just stop me. Now, in 2023, there was a problem uh, in sweet corn where we weren't achieving what we thought was acceptable control with the pyrethroid. And, you know, the vial tests have suggested to us that we have problems, but in reality, we do not target corn earworms in a row crop with a pyrethroid. Think about it. We just don't target that species in, in a row crop. But there were some issues in sweet corn in 2023. So myself and Dr. Stormy Sparks and our crews, we did a bioassay, you know, something a little more than looking at these moths and treated vials. And what I want to point out to you is in this bioassay, we looked at a pyrethroid lanate and radiant, all right? But we looked at a half rate of a pyrethroid, a full rate of a pyrethroid, and a 2x rate of a pyrethroid, and we're not getting good control. Even at a 2x rate, we only achieve 50% control of corn earworm with the pyrethroid. So I mentioned that to you just because you need to know. If we do run into a situation where we have to target corn earworms with a supplemental insecticide, we really need to be looking at alternative treatments other than pyrethroids. You know, and that's, that's a tough pill to swallow. We're going from a $3 treatment to a $15 plus dollar treatment. But you need to be aware of that. Um, if we start having corn earworm breakthroughs, and I don't, I don't see why we, anything should be different, we're probably going to be fine. But we'll be communicating with our county agents. So uh, if we start having some misses in the field, uh, we're going to have to make this move to these non-pyrethroid alternatives. All right, just a couple more comments on plant bugs. And this is an emerging pest in the state of Georgia. Um, in 2023, we sprayed almost 40% of the acres. And that's no big deal if you're in other parts of the country where they spray plant bugs a lot. But for us, it's an added input that uh, we really don't want to have to deal with. One of the things we've observed with tarnished plant bugs, especially you got a tarnished adult on the top left and the immature on the, the right, but it really appears that plant bugs are more of an issue on our early planted cotton. So I think that's an important thing to think about. You know, some of you guys are going to look at Thrive On. You know, it's going to help us a little bit on plant bugs. Maybe position it on your early planting fields because we know thrips are a lot worse, right? Um, but this is something that, that's concerning to me as an entomologist. And some of you deal with cloudy plant bugs. Uh, I don't know if John's in here. But when you're dealing with clouded, you just count them one and a half times. So two clouded is three, okay? And use the same thresholds, just add them with tarnish. But this is an emerging pest, and uh, it's one we need to be on top of and scout. Squaring cotton, we need to be running a sweep net. I mean, we need to run a sweep net. Um, once we get into bloom, we need to run a drop cloth. But most of our issues have been on pre-bloom cotton, and that's when we're running sweep nets. But uh, it's been very consistent where we've exceeded threshold in small plot trials on the station here in Tifton. If you fail to control plant bugs and they're exceeding thresholds, it's about a half a bell of cotton. I mean, it's pretty consistent. So that's, you have to deal with plant bugs. Uh, you need to address it, and it's problematic because during squaring is when a lot of our natural enemies, like big-eyed bugs, this is my favorite. I see our crew back there. We count a lot of big-eyed bugs, don't we, Maggie? We count a lot of big-eyed bugs. We like it when we see big-eyed bugs. We don't like it when we see plant bugs. All right? 
But if you go in and treat plant bugs in June, we're going to disrupt this whole system. And it's going to increase risk for other pests like mites or white flies or even corn earworms, right? So it's, it's, it's something we need to scout for. If you have a problem, we have to take care of it. If you don't have a problem, by all means, don't do anything. And let's let these beneficial insects build. Uh, yeah. Have you seen any thrive on spray for plant bugs? Yes. Yes. So I wasn't going to talk about Thrive on much, but we will. So a couple instances. We had a trial in Tifton. We planted on April 24th. High risk for plant bugs if you buy into the early planted cotton. We probably had the most consistent and longest duration of migration into this trial area I've seen in my career. We sprayed non-Thrive on four weeks in a row. That's non-Thrive. We sprayed thrive on twice. Also, we had thrive on planting scattered across Georgia from Midville to Plains to here. Was kale in here all the way down to Grady County. We had one in Colquitt County. We looked at 11 different sites. On adult plant bugs in Square, we triggered threshold three out of 11 on non-thrive on and two out of 11 on thrive on. So it's a help. But the interesting thing is now on adults, you don't have much effect. It's about a 20% reduction in adults. And I feel pretty comfortable with that number. On the immatures, we see about a 40, 50% reduction in nymphs. It thrive on will kill small nymphs. It's two. If you look at where we spray, we got a significant yield response spraying thrive on here with that endured it migration it was 150 pounds on nine thrive on it was 350 pounds so you know it's doing something it's not perfect well you know it's easy to kind of see the benefit of thrive on in the presence of high plant bugs but when we get into these more marginal situations that's where we we're having a hard time understanding what it's doing but if it can keep us from spraying, that's pretty important, right? So a little about what you spray plant bugs. Um, you know, one of the things I think you got to think about is aphids. If you're, you know, we're going to be spraying these plant bugs in the end of June, first week or so of July when the migration is occurring. I can assure you the end of June, 100% of the plants in your field have aphids on them. You go in there and spray plant bugs, kill the beneficial insects, what are the aphids going to do? They're going to come out the top of the roof, right? So when you're making a plant bug application, it just makes sense to use a product that has activity on aphids as well. And we have two, maybe three. Transform, very good on plant bugs, very good on aphids. Centric, good on plant bugs, good on aphids. Imidacloprid, it's also a neonic. Fair on plant bugs, fair on aphids. If you have a problem in June, you're looking at transform or centric. If it's just right on the edge, teetering, let's don't do anything. But if you did something, imidacloprid may get you by. I get questions about orthene or acetate. A lot cheaper than transformer centric, right? And I can tell you, orthene is really, really good on plant bugs. But orthene will absolutely annihilate beneficial insects. We don't need orthene going on cotton, squaring cotton in the state of Georgia, okay? It just creates risk for all kind of other things. One of the things I've been telling uh, growers in our, our little county meetings, you know, sometimes we do spider mite trials. You know how I make, uh, create an environment or create a situation where we can spray spider mites or have a spider mite trial? <coughs> spray orthane. Sometimes I have to spray it twice, but I can almost guarantee research grade population of spider mites by spraying orthane. Okay, any other questions for me? Um, and we can circle back around to some of this. I just want to take a little bit of time because I want most of our discussion to kind of relate around white, white flies. Yeah. Do we know if uh, clouded No. The problem with clouded is they're so erratic. 
And until we get Thrive on more acres, uh, we're, we're not there yet. In terms of insecticide use, though, whatever we use on uh, tarnish will kill cloudy. And, uh, yeah, you're kind of up there where y'all tend to get clouded, but, uh, but we don't know that answer. And I think people like you, Seth, uh, as we get this drive on, we're going to learn so much about that technology more from observation than anything we can do evaluating the product on the station or even on a single farm trial, you know. Any other comments for me? All right, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bill Snyder. If I can get all these wires. Nick, we might need some help. <laughs> <laughs> I might not be smart enough to put my talk up here. All right, I think I have this running. So there's no clicker, is that right? Okay, I can kind of, I can fake, kind of fake my way through. So just real quickly to introduce myself. So I come out to UGA after about 20 years at Washington State University. Um, so I'm pretty new to George and I'm very, very new to cotton. So I'm glad to have Philip here in case anything I say is too badly wrong. You should be able to dig me out of that hole. But obviously a very different climate between Washington State and, and here. <coughs> but anyway, I was going to say I feel a little bit like this fish here giving a talk about cotton insects, but I'll try to do my best. <coughs> out there I mostly work with uh, potato and mixed vegetable growers. Um, so again, cotton is a totally new crop to me. Just going to briefly mention, putting this together, I realized this is uh, Diane Green, who's one of our mixed vegetable growers. She was growing vegetables in North Idaho at high elevation, so she had about two months of frost-free production each year, maybe three months in a good year. And uh, they had some really different types of pest problems out there. So one year, Diane had a bunch of sweet corn that she was growing, and she'd go out every morning and find a little pile of husk corn and then cobs that looked like a person had gone and chewed all the kernels off the cob. So it's really a mystery. What is the pest that's causing this? And they figured out, well, a black bear is getting in there every night. So they had fish and game come out. And so they were close. Um, it was a bear, but not a black bear. So it was a, that's a grizzly bear. Um, so really, really different types of pest problems in Idaho than we find here. <coughs> but uh, this pest right here, whiteflies, might be just about as scary as grizzly bears to a lot of people in Georgia. Um, obviously, I don't think I have to introduce this insect pest too much. Um, for many years here, as I understand it, before I moved here, this is a relatively easy pest to manage. But in recent years, starting in 2016, 2017 or so, it's become just a really, really devastating pest. So one thing we've been working on is trying to figure out why are white flies becoming such a problem and is there something we can do to predict when and where white flies are going to be worse in one place or one year than another one. Um, one kind of clue that we had was that this first break outbreak years were the hottest and driest years um, ever recorded in Georgia. So there's some thought that maybe extreme weather could be some part of white flies becoming a worse problem. I tend to talk fast, so if uh, something I said doesn't make sense, just please feel free to jump in and, and interrupt. Um, so we've been looking at kind of three different hypotheses, or we considered three different hypotheses for why it is that white flies are a much worse problem now than they have been in the past. So the first I mentioned is this extreme heat and drought is becoming more common. Um, the second one is that as vegetable production becomes more diverse in Georgia, it might be providing sort of a year-round smorgasbord for these white flies so that any time of the year they have some green plant that's growing that they like that they can reproduce on, so there's no yearly break in the cycle. And the last one is that maybe some new type of white fly, genetically different, has blown in with some of the hurricanes. Um, I'm not going to talk about that last one too much, but we looked at the genetics of the white fly some, and it doesn't appear that there is anything genetically new about the white fly. So we've really been concentrating on these first two. Um, yeah, just to highlight that. 
Okay, so just briefly, so why might extreme weather make whitefly in particular a worse problem than it's been in the past? So to kind of fill up, follow up on what Philip was just talking about, so in a normal situation, whiteflies are controlled by two things. So there are predators that we see here. Whiteflies are kind of tasty snacks, and there's lots of predators like big-eyed bugs that will feed on whiteflies. And also plants, to some extent, are able to defend themselves against whiteflies. So they have their own sort of natural immune system they can use to fight off those whiteflies. What you see when you have really extreme weather is both of these two controls can kind of fall apart. So it can be so hot and so dry that the predators don't want to leave their little hiding places and go out and eat those white flies. You know, they don't want to dry up and overheat and die. So biocontrol can fall apart. And then when the plants are more stressed, if they're just trying to survive and have enough water to basically go through their natural processes and just stay alive, they don't have more energy to put towards their defenses. So both of these things can break down when it's really, really hot and really, really dry. And what that means is, so, you know, your natural enemies are unhappy, your plants are unhappy, but your white flies are always really happy. So they don't have anything eating them. The plants are weak and defenseless, and they can go through generations more quickly so that they can reproduce faster and faster and faster. So this is what we think might be happening, that all the natural controls break down under extreme weather. And just to touch again on the other one, this idea that now we've provided this sort of green bridge throughout the year. So white flies are a really unusual insect in that they attack almost any crop plant you can think of. And so it's thought that through the year they move through different plants. So they start with spring vegetables and fruits, cotton in the summer, fall vegetables. And then one thing that's been thought to be a key new addition to the farming systems is there's more winter brassicas growing. So where in the past the white flies wouldn't have had anything to eat during the winter, now they have these brassicas that they can move to. So again, there's just no time during the year where there isn't food for white flies now. So that could be the other possible explanation for why there's such a worse problem now. Okay, so the, pr the research I'm going to talk about is a big collaborative research project, including Philip and many other people at UGA. But I think everybody knows by this point the way things really work at the university is that I sit in my office and type and write grants and reports. And the people that do the work are the postdocs and the graduate students. So it's Mike and Olivia who did all the analyses, and Aperba is the one who collected the white fly data that we used. And what Aperba had done is he had maintained a trapping network throughout South Georgia, and this is before I was even here, um, where he was going out every week, was putting out sticky cards that white flies stick to. Um, he's doing that every week during the summer, every other week during the winter for two years. So he had an incredible amount of data on where and when white flies were active throughout um, South Georgia. So what Mike and Olivia then did with these data is they're really good at math type stuff. Um, they developed these really, really complicated models that I'm not going to talk about in too much detail. But the basic gist is they were looking at these data and trying to see, putting a bunch of different factors in there and see if there's something they could use to, that would accurately predict when and where the white flies were breaking out. So it would be things like uh, growing degree days here, so that's a measure of how hot it is. During this time period, when it was hot, it was also dry, so they're kind of linked. Uh, looking at things like were there brassicas there that they could have overwintered on and so on. Just try to see from this complex data set, can we figure out what is triggering whitefly outbreaks? I'm not going to talk about this in a lot of detail, but the big take-home message from this to sort of slightly oversimplify things is what they saw is that whiteflies were outbreaking where and when it was particularly hot and dry. So again, so good evidence that this heat and drought is really, really important. In contrast, this sort of brassicas, green bridge kind of an idea didn't seem to be nearly as impactful. So it seemed to really be hot, dry weather during the summer. That was the key. <clears throat> so again, thinking back to that yearly cycle, right, where we think most of the white flies are when it's hottest and driest is on cotton. This led us to the idea that we need to start to think about what specifically is going on in these cotton fields. Is this model I presented of worse biocontrol and weaker plants really something that could be contributed to whitefly outbreaks in cotton? So is heat and drought really the key to whitefly outbreaks? Okay, again, these are the actual people, um, two postdocs and a PhD student, Jordan, Pedro, and Krishna, who actually have gathered all the data and done all the analyses that I'm going to kind of take credit for here in a second. These are the real people. Um, I think it was, this was Philip's idea, I think, originally. Um, we realized we wanted to know what's the effect of drought. How do we do an experiment in the real world out on actual farms where we have relatively wet and relatively dry plants? And we realized that there's sort of a natural experiment already set up. When cotton is irrigated under center pivot, you have very wet plants underneath the center pivot, and then the corners are relatively dry. So you can control for pretty much everything 
that a grower might do on that field, but still have a wet treatment and a dry treatment without working on a research farm and a laboratory or anything like that. Um, so my folks went out to uh, 20 um, real cotton fields. Maybe some of you here in this room have participated in this. Um, throughout the summer, they collected white flies and their predators. And we also have collected some um, cotton foliage to look at whether the plant's chemistry, basically their defenses are changing. We're just going through that second part of the data now, but I can talk a little bit about um, some of the plant effects and some of the pest and uh, predator effects. <coughs> I just was going to point out, so if you see us out working in your field, this is the key to really all of our research. This right here is Jordan is working the DVAC. So this is a giant um, insect vacuum, so it's powered by a lawnmower engine um, that's bolted to a piece of metal that these people that we wear on our backs, and that lawnmower engine creates suction, and it collects insects into a collecting bag at the end. This is the absolute best way to collect insects. Like every insect that's out there will be collected within these DVACs, um, but I don't, I'm not sure that this is really actually OSHA certified or whatever to be wearing this machine. It's a little bit of a, a risky thing. They try to take it easy on these very hot Georgia days. This is our bug vac that is really the key to all this. <laughs> okay, so what we did with these data. So the good thing about what we're doing, hopefully, is that we're working all in real growers' fields. The bad part of that is the data are incredibly complicated, and there's lots of things we can't control. So we kind of measure everything, and then we put together what are called structural equation models. And to sort of simplify this, what you basically do is you say, okay, I think dry plants are leading to more white flies. You put together all the different web of interactions you think are important out there, and then you use the data to challenge that. So the do the data match the interactions that you think are important? How am I doing on time, Philip? Right. Okay. And you get a super, super complex model like this. So I'm not going to really, we have just generated these models, and we're starting to think about them ourselves and trying to unpack all the different information we can get out of this. But I wanted to point out just a couple things in these models that are relevant to what I'm talking about today. So basically how these models look. So here are all the different factors. This is the number of white flies, the number of predators. We have this NDWI, which is a measure of drought stress. So when that's higher, the plant has plenty of water. When that number is lower, the plant is drought stressed. Then we have all these different actions. So when you have a, a red arrow like this, it means that this has a negative effect on this. When you have a black arrow, this has a positive effect on this. Dashed line does no effect. Super, super complicated model came out of all this. But a couple things that I think are important to stress today. Okay, like I briefly mentioned, so we have this NDWI. So this is a, a measure of plant water stress that's taken from satellite images. So basically from satellite pictures, you see if the plants are more green, indicating they have lots of water, or they're more brown, indicating that they're kind of drying and shriveling up. And we can see that when the plants have more water, with a higher number here, we have a negative effect on white flies, which means well-watered plants do, in fact, have far fewer white flies. So that means the alternative, then, is true. So when the plants are drought-stressed, we saw far more white flies. So here again, from real grower fields, comparing these wet versus dry corners, it does seem that drought stress of the cotton plants is a really key driver of when you see more white flies. <coughs> So the other thing we were thinking about is, could there be effects on natural enemies when it's really hot and dry? Um, and this appears to be the case, too. So here, when you have uh, well-watered plants, you have fewer fire ants. So when you have drought-stressed plants, the canopy is relatively open. And apparently, that's a good habitat for fire ants. So fire ants are predators in part, even though they're kind of a pain. But the other thing that fire ants do is they feed a lot on other predators, like big-eyed bugs. So you can see when you have more fire ants, you have fewer other predators. So again, we see some evidence that when it's really hot and dry, biocontrol too is being disrupted. So when it's drought-stricken cotton, canopy's more open, more fire ants, fewer other predators. So both of these things seem to be true. So when you have a drought-stressed cotton plant, it seems to be more poorly able to defend itself, and you have fewer natural enemies to defend the plant. So both of these things are disrupted. Yeah, so Jason Schmidt is uh, at Tifton is someone that's looked a lot at that. And if I remember in his uh, paper that just came out correctly, the two things that I think seem to be most impactful. So what he did was he went out and collected predators, and then he takes the DNA out of the stomach of the predators and sees if they've eaten white flies recently. 
And I think the two that were most important based on they often eat white flies and they're really common were uh, minute pirate bug and big eyed bug. Is that right, Philip? I, I think, think I have that right. That's two, I would say. We got to use. Oh, and hippodamia also. Thank you. Yeah. So those are the ones which are good. You know, I, I mean, to me at least, big eyed bugs are pretty distinctive one. Hippodamia is a lady beetle. Um, so those are things that are pretty easy to scout. Minute pirate bug is tough. They're t yeah, minute pirate bugs are really tiny, as you might guess from that name. That's a tougher one. What's that? I don't think so. Do y'all know if y'all looked at roaches? The little roaches? They tan, they little tan, tan small roaches. They usually eat the geophrys, the hippodemia, and the minute pirate bugs. Those are the ones that they usually eat. It's the big guys. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm Anita. I wrote your presentation. I'm a postdoc. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, what I'm curious to, what I'm curious about with a lot of these predators I th is which are the ones that are there in the cotton before the white flies get bad and you can feed them, and which are the ones that once there's a ton of white flies, it's like party time and they all show up and it's a little bit too late. So I mean, y'all might have some insight, but generally it's strange. Like the big-eyed bug was the number one predator in potato fields in Washington State. It's the number one predator more or less here. So. Just working with them there. The good thing about them generally is because they eat so many different things, oftentimes they're in the crop before a particular pest is there. So they can be kind of that first line of defense. So they can be more important than you think they are sometimes based on their number. Um, and this is about all I have. I just want to, I like to end on a positive note. Um, so, that, you know, what is really the challenge, I think, with dealing with white flies and cotton and other places is when, you know, you have this extreme heat and drought, you're going to see more white flies, see more pests probably of many different types which triggers the need to spray. Of course, as Philip already mentioned, when you spray more, you kill more natural enemies, and then it just gets better and better situation for that pest. So the real trick, which is not going to be easy to solve, is how to get out of this cycle of you know, more disruption of biocontrol, more need to spray, further, further disruption of biocontrol, and so on. So what we need, no simple task, is to figure out ways we can reduce uh, drought stress on cotton probably in other crops and of course to enhance natural enemies and try to let them do the job that they want to do. So that's all I have. I think I'll just say through this many years of doing this type of stuff, like you, know, you collect a bunch of data in a real world situation, so many things you don't even measure and stuff like that. So like a lot of times it's just a lot of noise. And this is um, 
complicated regions. We don't have a way to like scale to show how important. This is a really, really, really strong relationship. No matter how you look at the data, um, this satellite measured aspect of plant stress correlates really strongly to more white flies. So, yeah, that seems to be a particularly strong interaction. With some of the models we did, we found a weak effect of um, how many ve vegetables were in the, the diversity of vegetables in the surrounding area, might have been the total acres of surrounding vegetables, <coughs> led to earlier detection of white flies, so consist consistent with what you're saying. So there does seem to be some evidence for the green bridge, but it didn't seem to be as important as the heat and drought effect. It was just really, really clear. And just to comment, one, one reason that effect is not as clear is because that that loop, that white fly loop, Sarah, in fact, she knows the loop very well, you know, it kind of never got too far away from vegetables. So the scale, I don't know what scale they are looking at, a five mile or two mile, I don't know what, you know, how you <coughs> that. But I can tell you, if you go 60 miles from here, you know, you look at cotton behind monkeys, <laughs> you know, it's different. <laughs> And it would probably show up, you know, more robust, you know, getting away from it. Um, Does y'all identify any windows that are such as the sun goes right by population outside of the commercial building? Yes, there's a list of wild hosts. And uh, they do contribute. Uh, but, uh, again, I don't have data here. But myself and Stormy Sparks, we believe cultivated host is, is what's really driving the overall population. But that's one good thing when it gets down to 25 degrees, like we did this year, or 21 here in Tippett, we kill a lot of those kind of annuals that kind of some years survive the winter. When we kill, I mean, it probably helps, but we believe it's more cultivated host, you know, just the sheer volume of acres. Sometimes we could find the source and sometimes we couldn't. Yeah. You know, one year we went to a trap, Sarah, and where we found a watermelon field about, was it half a mile? Yeah, a little bit. It was a watermelon field that had sprouted a bunch of volunteer watermelons. <coughs> oh boy. Oh boy. Oh, pot flies coming out of that. You know, and in the near term, you know, if we can all work together, our vegetable producers, our cotton producers, you know, when you're done with the crop, destroy that crop. We don't need a reproductive host that's got no value to us, so get rid of it. As a cotton farmer, if only at your cotton, pick your cotton, get that host out. Um, and, and we're managing the entire population, so those are just current recommendations we have, and, and, and it helps. It's in, all these little things. In terms of the, the impact of the broad effect insecticide on the natural enemies, when is kind of like um, the decision to go and spray the, when, when you have too high of a pressure of the pest? Or? So we have very well defined thresholds. Okay? And our primary tool, insecticide tool for managing white flies is the growth rate of the power process. Yeah. It is, has very, very little impact on natural enemies. So where we're disrupting the natural enemies would be more when we're targeting pests like stink bugs. Which, and we've got to do that. We've got to do that. <laughs> it's a bitter pill to swallow. Um, you know, we've got options for stink bugs. We use the least disruptive option. We use the bifenthrin compared to fibrin. But we're still disruptive. But we have no choice. Mm -hmm. We can't give up 200 pounds of cotton trying to manage white flies unless it got really, really bad. Then that's a different conversation. But you get to a point on, on white flies. Um, but if we do it right, 
natural enemies are important when we use that. And natural enemies are part of what we make that. We're still at the same rate on Mac, and we're talking about two weeks, two intervals. Five ounces, 10, 14 days apart. So important to be on time. Depending on what's going on in the fifth week. Depending on what's going on in the fifth week. One of the things we've observed when we get these massive migrations, we go out with five ounces of Mac, it's helping, but it can't quite handle them. We need to slide a cell or Savanto to kind of get everything back under control and then follow up with Mac. But what I've just talked about there, Mac, a cell, Mac, and we're talking a lot of inputs, but you've got to do it. So important to be timely. That, that second application of Mac, if, if you put out the first application and populations get knocked, knocked back, and you come back 10, 14 days later to scout, and it's below threshold, do you still need to make that application or can you hold off? I'd probably say it's where you are in terms of maturity of the crop. Um, I do believe cotton gets to a point why flies don't want to reinvest it. Um, there are situations, there's people with a lot of experience in here, that five ounces, the first application carries us. But if you're still lush and green, it's hard to be not to come with that same one. And again, pay attention to what's going on around you. Uh, so it's not an automatic second spray, but I would say the majority of the time, in my experience, that second spray is, is, is 80, 90% of you don't do that second spray. What did populations look like across the state this year? And then the reason I ask that question is, we were hot and dry on our farm. I know there were pockets where they were getting rain. We were very hot and dry irrigating all summer long. And we probably treated for white flies the least we have since before 2016. And, but, and we were scouting for them. And the places that we did treat, we treated at one time and, and we well needed. <coughs> yeah, it comes back to that rainfall patterns. And, and again, you can have localized drought, that's one thing, but when we have an area-wide drought, drought over a large geographic area, I think that's more what, what we're talking about affecting this overall population. Um, and again, you were probably hot and dry in August. I mean, it, yeah, you know, a lot in August. Yeah. But you were wet in May and June. And again, that population would just kind of kept it manageable in the absence of that, I don't know what we would have dealt with last year. And I'm convinced of that, right or wrong. Uh, but again, all we do is scout and be timely. And I can't stress the importance of that first application. You've got to be on time. You don't need to be early. But if you have to be early versus being late, you be early, 100%. You know, we got a little window uh, after Aces died. You got a lot of late bugs out there. It gives us a little, usually gives us a little bit of time, unless you got spray for things up, right? Yep. By the way, but that, that's always something I look at. We got plenty of ladybugs. Maybe they're going to hold us for a while. Then they should get a migration. Spray. Yeah. All right. Hey, we'll be here for a little longer if y'all want to stay on the conversation, but. Our time is the last. Appreciate y'all coming.